morning is 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 13. It is quite a hunk of scripture, so if it helps for you to follow along in your pew Bibles, it starts on page 284. Listen now to the word of God. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how Ahab had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of the man by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. It said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Startle us, O God, with your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Back in 2019, Joy Clarkson, citing 1 Kings chapter 19, tweeted, This is your gentle reminder that one time in the Bible, Elijah was like, God, I'm so mad, I want to die. So God said, here's some food. Why don't you have a nap? So Elijah slept, ate, and decided things weren't so bad. Never underestimate the spiritual power of a nap and a snack and a tweet. And that's when I realized that apparently the foundation of my faith can be summarized in less than 280 characters. <laughs> There's a lot to not love about Twitter, but this tweet is such a gem, and I could not have found it without social media. So sometimes I'm grateful for the words of wisdom that we can come across on the internet. Not all of the internet is words of wisdom, mind you. <laughs> so when the scripture passage came up in the lectionary for this Sunday, the lectionary three-year cycle of readings for the church, I knew that I would have to preach on it. Now the book of the first Kings starts with the death of King David. In the next two Sundays, you'll hear more about his successor, his son, King Solomon. We'll talk a little bit about wisdom. We'll talk a little bit about his legacy and the building of the temple. But what follows after Solomon is more
more deaths and more successions with all the messiness and jealousy and power grabs that can come with that. You all have read some Shakespeare, I'm sure. What we need to know for today's story is that King Ahab is in power, and he marries Jezebel. Jezebel is the daughter of King Ethel of the Sidonians. And like many women in the Bible, she gets a pretty bad rap for enticing Ahab to worship her gods. But really, she's just staying consistent to her religion. It's Ahab who builds an altar for other gods, knowing full well that his God has said, one, thou shalt not have any other gods before me, and two, thou shalt not make for yourself any idols. Ahab knows these commandments. Jezebel just marries into them and probably never agreed to them. In fact, she brings with her to this marriage her own identity and faith traditions, and it's Ahab who acquiesces to her. Unfortunately, what happens under Ahab and Jezebel's rule is that the prophets of the Israelite God are killed and violently purged, forcing Elijah, who is one of those prophets, to go on the run. And this is where we find him today. He is tired. He is hungry. He is a wanted and chaste man whose life is in danger. And he thinks, you know what? I'm ready to give up. I am tired, and this is too hard. Powerful people want me dead, and I'm tired of trying to escape. Now, I know that the original authors of the First Kings were not thinking about mental health, or depression, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors as they wrote this story. Mental health, as we understand it today, is anachronistic to the Bible. But we who are gathered here today have lived through a pandemic, are living through a pandemic. And this pandemic has taken many lives, most of them due to COVID, but some of them due to poor mental health access and the stigma and loneliness that comes with depression and anxiety, all of which have been heightened this past year and a half. And frankly, I can no longer read Elijah's response without connecting it to the real-life struggles for mental health that affect so many, including myself. If you have lost a loved one, be it to suicide or otherwise, you are welcome to grieve in this place. This is a safe place for you. And while there is so much we do not know about what happens after death, no matter what the cause of death, here's what I do know. First, that love never ends. That's biblical, right in 1 Corinthians. God's love for the one who died, your love for the one who died, their love for you never ends. Even if life ends tragically or unexpectedly, nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Love prevails and love remains. Second, I know that in life and in death, we belong to God always. No matter how we die, in fact, no matter how we live, we belong to God. God claims us as God's own beloved, and there is no need for shame or secrecy. We are God's own. And finally, I believe that while God reaches out towards us, even in the hardest moments of our lives, sometimes our brains our bodies and souls are unable to feel or experience God's love. My heart breaks for those for whom God's love feels distant or untrue, or like that it doesn't even matter because the burden of life itself is just too much right now. In recent years, we learned of four Capitol Police officers who have died by suicide. All four of them de defended our democracy and are protected our elected officials that, on that January 6th insurrection in Washington, D.C. 
The trauma and the continued vilification and lies of spouse must have been so overwhelming and lonely. We pray for their family and their friends as they grieve their deep loss. And we pray for this country, for they pay the ultimate price for defending it. We all must do better. The truth is, however, I cannot speak to the dark night of their souls or anyone else's. I can only speak to my own. So here is my story. I had a baby 17 months ago, 10 days before the entire city shut down. I wasn't sleeping well, and while I love my family dearly, all of a sudden, everybody was home. All the time. <laughs> Which word, introvert, can be a bit challenging. My brain chemistry and hormones were just all thrown off balance, and I came down not just with the baby boobs, but full-on postpartum depression. Now, everyone's postpartum depression looks and feels a little different. For me, I was able to be fully present for my family during the day, but the nights were so hard. At night, my guilt over not spending enough time with the baby the exhaustion of not getting more hours of three hours of sleep at a time, the frustration of being stuck at home all the time, and the fear of the virus would all surface at once, and I would just cry, preferably in a closed closet that was darkened. Sometimes I even felt like Elijah when he said, it is enough now, Lord. Through it all, I was super well supported by Mike, my family, my friends, even our pediatrician and my OB-GYN and therapist that I began to talk to during this time. If you are suffering from depression or struggling with your mental health, please reach out for help. We have counselors that we can refer you to, and there are people and medications that can make a difference. If you can't make your own neurotransmitters, store-bought is just fine. <laughs> now, I don't know what all Elijah was struggling with. Maybe it was some form of situational depression, but I'm not a therapist or a doctor, and I just don't know Elijah well enough, or nor am I qualified enough to diagnose him. But we do know that he wanted to give up on life. And in this valley of the shadow of death, God offered him a broom tree. A broom tree is actually just like a small brush or shrub, and under the shade of that broom tree, Elijah found rest and food. There are only two biblical stories that mention the broom tree. This is one of them, Elijah. And the first one is the story of Hagar and Ishmael from Genesis chapter 21. In both these stories, the heat was unbearable and overwhelming, and both Elijah and Hagar thought they would not survive their time in the wilderness, nor did they think it would be worth surviving. But God comes and provides a moment of shade in their desert experience, and they are able to continue on their life journey. It is said that the image of the broom tree is that of just enough. The broom tree is fairly small and low to the ground, barely providing enough shade for one person. But it was important in providing a moment of relief for those early wilderness travelers. The broom tree experience reminds us that when we come to a desert moment in life, as Hagar and Elijah did, God can and often does provide us a little bit of shade to get by. The image is not of deep shade or air conditioning, but just enough shade. And for Elijah, just a quick nap, a small cake and a jar of water, nothing fancy, not a huge feast, not even a full night's rest, but just enough to make it to the next part of his journey. Included in your bulletin today, bulletin today is the mini search with some questions and numbers and resources. One of them, which you can find online, is called Everything is Awful and I'm Not Okay. Questions to 
ask before giving up. It is that just enough approach to feeling like you can make it to tomorrow. I encourage you to keep this insert, look over it, share it with someone you know or love. Included in it are things as simple as, are you hydrated? If not, have a glass of water. And my personal favorite question, have you eaten? In many Asian cultures, a parent and other adults will show their love for you not by saying, I love you, by asking, have you eaten? When I was a kid, my grandparents lived with us, and every day after school, my grandmother, my grandmother would ask me, have you eaten? Have you eaten? And I'd say, sure. I had some kind of school lunch, pizza, or hamburgers, or something. But then she'd cook me a bowl of ramen, the instant noodle kind. And to this day, for better or for worse, that sodium-filled bowl of noodles still tastes like love to me. <laughs> now, if you read the Bible, you will find that food and rest are not just good for our bodies, they are spiritual practices. God, food represents life, love, community, trust in God and being with and in Christ. God feeds the Israelites in the desert with manna, bread from heaven. Jesus feeds the 5,000 with fishes and loaves. Jesus shares his last supper with his disciples, a feast we remember and partake in still to this day. And in our gospel lesson from today, John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Food feeds the body, and food feeds the soul. It is holy and sacred work to eat and to eat together. In the same way, rest is holy and sacred work as well. In fact, to rest is to be like God. For on the seventh day of creation, what did God do? God rested. God took a Sabbath. And so when God tells Moses to chisel down that fourth commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, God is not trying to restrict us or bind us to more rules. God is helping us to become more like God's self. <laughs> Rest is holy. And if it's good enough for God, trust me, it's good enough for you. Nat Bishop, Trista Hersey, is the founder of the Nat Ministry, and she, she writes, We believe rest is a spiritual practice, a racial justice issue, and a social justice issue. We believe rest is radical and revolutionary. We believe rest is a form of resistance. This is about more than naps. We are attempting to disrupt a toxic system that ties our worth to how much we produce. Reimagine productivity. It is not exhaustion. It is not grinding yourself like a machine. You are not a machine. Rest is a beautiful interruption in a world that has no pause button. On her website, you can download a special gift from you, for you, from the Nat Ministry, and I'm happy to share with it if, share it if you need an actual copy. It is a guilt-free nap voucher. <laughs> a guilt-free nap voucher. When is the last time you took a nap and didn't feel even just a little bit guilty about it? Or when is the last time you took a break from being productive? Sabbath is not cleaning your house doing the dishes, washing your clothes. Stop being productive. It's countercultural. Food and rest are spiritual practices, and to deny ourselves of them is to deny our bodies and souls from connecting and communing with God. This message is for each and every one of you, because I know you all are tired. I can see it in your faces, even behind those masks. 
And friends, as we return from this pandemic, let us not return to what was, but to what is healthiest for our bodies and our souls and our hearts. So yes, this message is for each and every one of you. But this message is also one we must take out into the world far beyond these walls, living it, embodying it, and offering it to others so that transformation might be possible not just in our own lives, but in the world. There's a story recounted in the book Sleeping with Bread, Holding What Gives You Life by Dennis Lynn, Sheila Fabrican, and Matthew. In it, we tell the story that during the bombing raids of World War II, thousands of children were orphaned and left to starve without homes or families. The fortunate ones were rescued and placed in refugee camps where they received food and good care. They were free to eat and rest and encouraged to just be children. But many of these kids who had lost so much still could not sleep at night. They feared waking up to find themselves once again homeless and without food. Nothing seemed to reassure them. Finally, someone hit upon the idea of giving each child a small loaf of bread to hold at bedtime. Holding their bread, these children could finally sleep in peace. All through the night, that loaf of bread reminded them, today I ate, and I will eat again tomorrow. Today I ate, and I will eat again tomorrow. Friends, that is the good news of the gospel. God gives us our daily bread, and holding on to that bread, we are able to rest, so that we might be equipped to share God's love, and the bread of life with others. We live one day at a time, one meal at a time, one nap at a time. So friends, have you eaten?